I work with ingredients that are native to the Americas, North through South America. I've done a lot of studying on it, self-taught in ethnobotany and natural history, and, and then I picked up Indian uh, Native American cookbooks and started to, to fall into it. And it's uh, really now developing into a point where uh, I think I've kind of created what I would like to do as a person, uh, as, a, as a chef, as somebody that's concerned about our food system, about how everybody eats today, and but even more so deeper than that, the inherent medicinal qualities, the, the health of our of America's whole foods, America's indigenous native foods. Um, so, so tonight is a part of that. I, I'm working on what I would call a California cuisine, which would be a cuisine that is all native to California. California is a very important uh, country, or uh, I shouldn't say country, but it basically is. <laughs> uh, it is almost a country as far as the way we're leading the way. But California is a very special state because it has different topo topographical type of areas which have created different little climates in different parts of the state. So there's, you've got the Great Basin coming down in the south, and you've got the Sierras up there in the east, and of course you've got the coast on the Pacific, and then you've got in the center there, uh, which has all created different types of foods. So uh, you're going to experience part of that tonight on the menu. Uh, you've already had a chance to taste the, uh, the mesquite flower rabbit. Mesquite flower does grow, it is a native, but it is also a native to South America too. It does grow in California, up along the, up through the Southwest. Texas kind of treats it as a weed, but it's actually a very nutritious plant. And Native Americans have learned to eat every, uh, get something out of every part of the tree. So it's an amazing, it's an amazing flower. Uh, it's also a spice, it's sweetened. Uh, I can't take, say enough about mesquite flour. Um, so I, I, I braised the rabbit in mesquite flour and hazelnuts, and then uh, pulled it, and then uh, we reintroduced the, the braising liquid back into the back into the rabbit, and then created amaranth tortillas. I was going to do a mesquite tortilla too, which would might have complemented it too. So maybe we'll try that again. And then of course you had the pumpkin chestnut soup. Chestnuts. Why I do this is. And everything I tell you about is, is kind of important to, for me, but it's also becoming an experience for everybody else to learn about. Because like chestnuts, I don't know if you know, but we're eating Chinese chestnuts. Uh, I, should, I shouldn't put it that way. I mean, what, we, what we're eating now are hybrids from the Chinese because they are light resistant to chestnuts. But the chestnuts you had tonight are not. These are American chestnuts, un, unhurt by the blight. There's a little grove in Auburn, California that has American chestnuts, untouched by the blight. So that's what you had tonight. They are, they are uh, actually kind of sweet. So that was in the pumpkin and, and the che uh, chestnut soup. And then for the entree tonight, we have uh, uh, a working ranch up in Oregon, Black Shadow, El Rancho's Bison Tri-Tip, which uh, uh, they raise up there. And it, great prices, too, actually. And what I did is I encrusted that with uh, uh, dried mushrooms and uh, uh, toasted pepitos. Work them together with a little bit of smoked salt and that's the crust. And you put it in, you put the bison, I sear it. Uh, you sear it over a pan and then you put it in the oven, man, maybe 15, 20 minutes depending on how hot your oven is because you don't want to go on bison, you don't want to go past 110 to 115 degrees. It's very important because then it becomes very very chewy and, and uh, you know, so it's very, it's a very uh, particular meat, absolutely low in fat, high in protein, and it'll always be grass fed. So it's an amazing animal. That's something else that we, we sh as Americans should really create a market, a bigger market for, as opposed to, to the beef that's coming out. That, uh, and lamb, by the way, has the highest footprint. I don't know if you know that, but, but lamb is, is ecologically the worst meat that we have because it has at least a very high uh, footprint. I just thought I'd kill that. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, uh, and then along with that, you have my hand processed acorn flour sauce that I did with uh, madrone bark. Now, madrone bark is madrone, bay, bay trees, oats, manzanitas, they all grow together and they all have fruits, they all have something to offer. So, I found that out a long time ago. Pick, pick acorns. You have to leach them because they're high in tannic acids. 
You can take butanic acid and clean your clothes with it if, if uh, you needed to. That's a lot of the guys, survival guys, know. You know, if you ever seen a, you ever seen a clean guy out there in the woods, you know you probably use tannic acid to clean his clothes. <laughs> so anyway, uh, so you have to leach out the you have to leach out the tannins. You just do that by water. I got a very easy method. I throw them into a bucket. I'll, I'll shell them, throw them into a bucket, and just change the water twice a day, three times a day, as long as you can for until the nuts come out sweet, until there's no longer that that astringency that the tannic acid gives. Then, then I, I uh, dry them, grind them, and uh, then so we get the acorn flour. It's a great, excellent thickening agent. So that's a natural thickening agent as opposed to like big, uh, whatever, baking powder and all the other ones. Uh, uh, also, then we also have Native Harvest, Harvest Wild Rice. It's a dish that I call Grains of the Americas. And what this is, it's a, it's a dish that has Everything that America is about, as far as what grains are about in America. We don't actually have grains, per se, like you would call wheat a grain. Wheat is a grain. What we have, and I call it grains because it rolls off the tongue, it sounds wonderful, but basically wild, wild rice, as you probably know, is a grass. And the, the, the wild rice that I'm using tonight comes from the Anishinaabe in Minnesota, uh, where they, what you do is when the, when the rice is ready to be harvested, they pull it down into their canoes. They're taking their canoes and you know they're out there the, the way they've been doing it for thousands of years. They pull that down into the boat and shake it down and it goes, goes into the canoe and then they then there's another process that they have. I'm sure if you went on YouTube, you could find these processes on how they do that. But it's, it's really pretty amazing and it has such an aroma to it. Now, try black uh, wild rice that you get from like Lumbergs. Lumbergs is an excellent wild rice. But it doesn't have the smell that real life wild rice that's been growing in the same place for thousands of years it doesn't have the same aroma. So wild, this, uh, this uh, wild harvest uh, uh, wild rice is just amazing. It's just amazing. It's actually kind of brownish too. It's not black. So, and I mixed that with tapari beans, which is a true American bean that kind of grew down in the southwest. It's a drought resistant bean. They're tiny, high in protein. They're, like I said, they're drought resistant. Very, very nice, also along with some Inca corn, which is choco, and it's a huge, they're huge kernels, uh, and also uh, dried cranberry juice and pine nuts. Now, what I did for you tonight, everybody can take home a gift tonight. You got pine cones on your table, everyone, there's enough there for everybody, I think. If not, I have them. Inside, you'll find pine nuts. Those are not regular pine cones. They are pine nuts in disguise, if you will. So everybody take them on if you don't get one, and just let them sit at room temperature, and they open up, and they're just saying, "Here we are." It's like a, it's like a carriage full of babies or something. You know? It's amazing. I have one that's open and has and is carrying the seeds. There may be one or two of them in there. So make sure you take a pine cone home, leave it at room temp, and and uh, that's you know you'll have you'll enjoy it. Toast them afterwards. And there's a shell on there that you got to take off, and you can re-toast them again too. So let me move along here, and then also we have. Uh, I have a couple of guys that, that grow this for me. It's uh, nettles. We have nettles tonight. High in vitamin C and Native American. Wee. Beautiful. We did that with some hazelnut milk. We raised hazelnut milk along with some red sorrel. Red sorrel is beautiful. It's part of the oxalis family, so it is kind of sour. Too much of it, of course, so uh, will kind of uh, intoxicate you a little bit. <laughs> and so we finished that off with some, uh, I said it's in the hazelnut milk along with some butter, salt, and pepper, and that's all it really needs. So you'll have a chance to experience that. And then for dessert tonight, we did the chestnut flour. The chestnut flour comes out of North Carolina. It's a, it's a beautiful tasting flour. That's also untouched by uh, blight. So that's a good flour. And we did a wild blueberry crisp with pine needle cream. Mm -hmm. You gotta try the pine needle cream. It's subtle and it'll stay with you right at the end there. So enjoy the meal. If I haven't gotten you started on wanting to try this, nothing. <laughs> <laughs>